Gary, you asked me a direct question. Am I a fundamentalist Randian, I guess? Uh, or you also said Nietzschean, but I'm not sure that Nietzsche was actually promoting Randianism. I suppose there's a certain way that one could look at it that would say that he was, but I, I would disagree with them, anyone who would say that. In the same way as I would, uh, I would strongly disagree uh, with people who said that he was paving the way for Nazism. He wasn't, and uh, he certainly wasn't paving the way for for Randism either, Objectivism or whatever you call it. Now, um, my answer to that is, we're essentially dealing with the individual and society, or the individual and the group, or me versus every other thing that exists now that is sentient and everything that ever will exist and we're sort of comparing my existence with its existence or its potential existence well I approach both matters through two material conditionals uh, two um, formulas formulae or whatever um, I'm not entirely sure that either exists. I'm not, in, and I don't mean this in a solipsistic sense, but I haven't quite worked out, and I'm not sure anybody has worked out what they believe an individual to be, because it essentially boils down to what you believe consciousness to be. Um, not where consciousness comes from, but what its ultimate nature is. And that's a tough one, because um, let's say that there are those who say that consciousness is essentially just a, a constant and all of our different personalities and our different perceptions and our different points of view are simple variants on the same thing and that if you strip away all the experiences that somebody has had and all the um, outside influences, i.e. their DNA or their uh, the physical body they've always inhabited or the things like that, um, that my consciousness is not different in any way at all from anybody else's. Okay, now that's, you know, there's there's a huge argument there. Um, and it seems that the best we can do in that case is to take sides as to what consciousness is. But, what I say is when I sort of get up in the morning and I try to deal with the reality of the situation, I have to suspend that debate and take sides. I have to assume that my individuality exists. And here's my first material conditional, my first equation here. If I'm going to take it as a given that my individuality exists, then certain things flow from that. It doesn't mean that I'm taking my own individuality as a given in an absolute sense. Now, this is where objectivism and I decisively part company. Um, and I spend an awful lot of time arguing against people that have something vaguely resembling the Aiden Rand point of view. I'm only assuming that my individuality is, an, is a, a, a real thing. At the end of the day, I don't know. Now, uh, that to me is an axiom, but I must remember that it's an axiom. If, if it's an axiom that you then forget about having been an axiom, you take it as a solid fact, then you've got Randianism then you've got objectivism, whatever, uh, libertarianism, what I would say, taken to an unreasonable extreme. That's where I disagree with Ayn Rand. And that's an incredibly powerful disagreement because I disagree with the one idea at the very heart of the entire edifice of her philosophy, uh, that the individual is an absolute I say no. We don't know that it's an absolute, and the best we can do is assume that it is an absolute. 
Now, that's fine, but we mustn't forget that we're simply making an assumption here. <laughs> Uh, that is an absolutely central point, because I think that when Ayn Rand goes out and builds her gigantic philosophy, she not only um, assumes that the individual is an absolute, she forgets ever having made that assumption. That is important. And I don't say that it destroys her entire philosophy, but it may sort of make her entire philosophy impossible because she has no bedrock if, of course, if we say that the, that the individual is not an absolute. But, again, there's a difference between taking something as a solid, utter fact uh, and an assumption. If we assume that the individual is an absolute, then um, Ayn Rand makes sense. If. <laughs> a gigantic if. Same thing goes for society. If I assume that society exists, or if I want to function in this world, I have to assume that society exists. Now, I walk out in front of, I don't know, a police officer. Um, I take a piece of litter out of my pocket and I drop it on the ground and I say, what are you going to do about that? Or I say, watch this officer and I walk over to a car, take out my keys and key the car. I say, what are you going to do about that? Well, I know what's going to happen. He's going to arrest me, maybe? He's going to take some sort of action against me, or he probably will. Um, and I'll end up in front of a judge, maybe. I'll end up behind bars, maybe. Um, all these things will happen. Now, that's just a bunch of things that will happen, but it's all based on the idea that there is a thing out there called society that has rules. Now, that thing does not phenomenally exist, that thing called society. Um, but... <laughs> try and function as if it doesn't exist and watch what happens. So it's the same thing as my own individuality. I have to assume that it exists. I have to assume that society exists. But I have to remember that society only exists as an assumption, as a material conditional. Because when if I, when I drop that piece of litter on the ground or key somebody's car and the policeman slaps the cuffs on me or whatever he does, arrests me, even just lectures me or whatever, all that is happening is brute force is being applied to me. But there's something else that seems to be going on as well. The state, society, um, the law is applying its jurisdiction in a case like that. And it's applying a jurisdiction that I accept. Because, let's say somebody does that to my car, I would call the police, wouldn't I? <laughs> um, so, I'm not going to um, say that society doesn't exist any more than I'm going to say that the individual doesn't exist. But both of these things exist provisionally. Both of these things exist as assumptions. They may be necessary assumptions, uh, or at least it's easier to assume that they exist than it is to assume that they don't exist, but they're still just assumptions. They're still just things that I, I am consciously taking for granted. They're not things that phenomenally exist. So I would tell a libertarian, I would tell an Ayn Rand type, your individuality may be an illusion. You're just sort of making a leap of faith saying that your, individu your individuality is an absolute. And I would then tell a collectivist, if we, you know, loosely uh, referred to as a collectivist, that you're just assuming that something called society exists, or the, the rest of the universe exists. 
And you've got to remember I'm not talking about solipsism here. My case about society and the individual is best illustrated in my relationship between, well, my relationship with the policeman. That policeman is not absolutely a policeman. He's just another human being. But because of all the, the assumptions that everybody else in society makes, that policeman has more power than I do. I'm a big guy, okay? I'm 6'1", I weigh 230 pounds. If I see a policeman who is five foot nothing and weighs less than a hundred pounds, um, there's still a power imbalance there. Um, even if he's only, you know, let's say he's not even armed, he doesn't have anything else. What he's got is the assumption of the power of the state behind him, or the power of society, or societal sanction behind him. Um, and this may be a sanction that I have accepted. So when a cop says, don't key that car, or, oh, you've just keyed that car, you're in trouble. Um, I understand what's happening, because he, <laughs> the, the way that society is so configured is that he does have more clout than his physical ability to coerce me would imply. Um, but in an absolute sense, no, he doesn't. Um, it's just an assumed thing just the same as my individuality is assumed. So, if I'm going to assume that society exists, if I'm going to take it as a given that society exists, um, I'm going to negotiate with all of its other members to determine what each individual's obligations are towards that society. Um, this is where, if you ask me, ethics come from. There has to be a beginning and an end to my responsibility to society. And the reason I say that is, we're only saying that society exists as something that we agree exists. I would argue that in your view of things, society or everybody else and their... Um, and the aggregate of their various consciousnesses is somehow bigger than me. I'm saying that is an assumption. It may be correct, but it may not be. And that imbalance lies at the very heart of your ethical formula of an imbalance of obligation. Myself versus the group. Now remember, I'm not saying that absolutely the group does not exist the way that, say, um, an Ayn Rand type person might say. I'm saying that the group effectively exists, but its existence is contingent upon my acceptance of its existence. And therefore, we, all the constituent members of that group, have to get together and decide in what way the group exists what are the limits of that group, and what claims the group has on each of the individuals. This is a negotiation. Um, and it's a, not a negotiation that takes place between me and the group. It's a negotiation that takes place among us all. Um, it takes place on the macro and on the micro level. But again, we've got to remember that it's just a negotiation. We've got to exist in this world. And to exist in this world, to function in this world, we have to have rules. We have to have some means of navigating our relationships with each other. That's my view of society. Um, it's not that I don't believe in the individual, and it's not that I don't believe in the group. What I do believe is that both are provisionally facts as far as convenience goes. Neither one is an absolute. You understand how big an issue this is, I think, and that 
a come and go on YouTube is, uh, or even a live debate is not going to solve this. This is a truly gigantic um, question. What am I and what is my relationship to everything else? I would say we're not sure of that, but we've evolved uh, a certain means of navigating that question. We mustn't assume that the assumptions that we've made are in any way real. They are things that we have accepted as provisionally real. Once you accept an axiom as reality, you start to make serious errors. And again, this is not to be mistaken for solipsism. Something is going on here, and something has to be managed, and certain assumptions have to be made. But be careful of taking it all as a certainty, because you get those imbalances that you refer to that create gigantic ethical traps like the one you allude to. Thanks for your response.